In this lecture and in the next lecture, I want to present two um, quite different and emerging theories of learning that have been developed in response to a considerable amount of work being done with learners and technology. Both of these theories have the potential to disrupt our current notions of schools and schooling, formal education, and the role that technology could play in learning. I also feel that they disrupt our thinking about the role of the teacher, that is, what practices should we be adopting, what role do we play in a school classroom. Society today, in most parts of the world, are increasingly um, dominated by the ubiquitous presence of digital technologies. Mobile devices in particular are having a profound effect on how people communicate and connect with one another. This is a list of all of the things that I've done on my devices um, in the last week. And I want to highlight the number of these things that involve me making connections with other people. So let's have a little look. I shared files with colleagues. I did a lot of emails, too many emails. Um, I've checked my Facebook feed frequently. I've sent a tweet, I've tweeted, I've read my Twitter feed. I've followed a cat on Instagram, Skyped my daughter in Germany, texted my sister in England. I contributed to a Google community on digital technologies issues. I've contributed to a collaborative um, website, sorry about the typo, and I've done a hangout with um, some school-based tutors that I work with. That's how I connect with people, but I've also used technology to read the news, to look up information, to research some more information about things that I'm particularly interested in. And I think it's really important to highlight the way that we use these mobile devices and some not so mobile devices, but primarily our mobile devices, connect us even more so than ever before in history. You've possibly seen this um, particular meme before. In fact, I may have even shared it with you. Um, and it's a quote attributed to Albert Einstein. I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of, idi of idiots. And it's very easy for people, particularly of my generation, to be quite disparaging of young people when they see them um, seemingly obsessed by and glued to their mobile devices. But I wonder if there's a different spin on the way young people um, are using these devices. In Introduction to Educational Settings, I introduced you to a writer, Dana Boyd, who looks at the social connections that young people make with technology. And I'm wondering if we can build on our young people's um, seemingly natural affinity with these devices and with their ability to use the devices to connect themselves. I'm wondering if we can build on that to connect them to things that we think might be more useful for their learning. I'm also wondering if it's, if it's just the hanging out with each other that Dana Boyd puts down to technology use or whether young people, in fact even you or I, use these devices almost as a back channel. I'm wondering how many of you, when you're sitting in a lecture or a seminar or like I was on Friday and again on Monday at a conference, where somebody said something and I thought, I don't actually know very much about that. And you quickly whip out your device and look it up. And instantly you're connected to further information about that which you are interested in. And I'm wondering if there's a potential there as well to harness the power of technology and young people's affinity with it to tap into information and connections with other people, but for learning purposes, not purely for social purposes. First statement, if the 20th century was characterised by relative stability, the 21st century will be characterised by its fluidity. 
I want you to think a little bit about the rapid and continuous pace of technological change and the impacts that that is having on how society works. In a previous slide, I shared with you my own use of technology. Mobile devices and networks are increasingly ubiquitous and the uptake of technology for a whole range of purposes is quite significant and it's changing how we do things in many aspects of society, in our private lives, in our professional lives, in our learning lives. And this rapid and continuous, rapid pace and continuous nature of technological change and how people interface with it has led commentators like Doug Thomas and John Sealy Brown to ask this question, do we need a new framework to make sense of learning in our world of constant change? There have been three main theories of learning that have come to dominate the educational discourse around learning over a number of decades. Behavioralism, as you are probably familiar with, the idea that learning results from stimulus and response. Cognitivism, where learning is seen as a process of inputs, where individuals make mental constructs that are committed to memory and then later retrieved. In both of these uh, learning theories, knowledge is seen as external to the learner and something that is processed by the learner. The third dominant um, theory of learning, and one that is probably reflected more in how you see teaching and learning uh, occur in schools at the moment, is around constructivism, where individuals create knowledge as we attempt to understand our own experiences. Um, and constructivism is really centred on that whole notion of meaning-making. And it's through those experiences, particularly active, hands-on, experiential learning experiences, that we tend to make sense of the world around us. But more recently, people like Thomas and Celie Brown, and more particularly George Siemens and Stephen Downs, they point out that these theories of learning developed in a time before the impacts of ubiquitous digital technologies were felt. In a world that's dominated by digital technologies, where things don't necessarily have to be linear, where technology can store and retrieve information more efficiently than the human brain can, and where the way that societies work is constantly changing. So again, the question is asked, do we need a new framework to make sense of learning in this world of constant change? I want to give you... Uh, let me give you an example of what this might be. My daughter runs a corset-making business. She designs and manufactures corsets, as in this photo. Um, however... She has no formal qualification that says she can do this. She has avoided formal post-compulsory secondary education, but has become very skilled at doing what she does. So how has this happened? She's experimented, had lots of mistakes along the way, lots of really badly made courses. But she, most importantly, has made a connection to a global community of corset makers who knew there was such a thing. And through the very open and generous, generous sharing that occurs within this community, my daughter's skills in designing and making corsetry have improved. In addition to this, she has searched the web and engaged with a huge array, array of um, materials and resources and information on the web to support and enhance her skills development in this area. She's also tapped into people who can help her with the social media marketing, with the business management, with um, dealing with overseas manufacturers. So she's tapped into a personal network of people who can support her. 
And what this demonstrates is that learning does not have to be through formal networks. And we've talked about this in Introduction to Educational Settings and Society as well. But if this, this raises the question to me as an educator, if this can happen without a formal education environment, what does this mean for learning in those formal education environments? Thomas and Celie Brown have this, um, what I think is a quite wonderful uh, quote. In communities, people learn in order to belong. In a collective, people belong in order to learn. So in a community, and situate yourself as a beginning teacher in a community of practice of more experienced teachers in the school that you um, first get employed in. That group of teachers, that school that you belong to is a community. And what you will tend to do as a new entrant into that community is to learn how things happen, the way things are done in that community. And you'll learn that and take on those habits in order to feel as though you belong, to cement your place within that community. Thomas and Seely Brown put forward a slightly different version of um, learning that is not just individual, and that's learning in a collective, and that you join a collective in order to learn from that collective. And I think that that's the sort of learning that my daughter undertook um, in her um, desire and her journey to becoming a corset maker. Collective learning is peer-to-peer -peer without any hierarchy. It brings like-minded individuals together around things of mutual interest without the need for formal educational structures. And this brings me to the theory of connectivism. It's put forward by two people, George Siemens and Stephen Downs, who are really the, um, the grandfathers or the fathers of the worldwide MOOC movement, massive open online courses that are sweeping through post-compulsory education. And this brings us to the theory of connectivism. It's a theory that's put forward by two um, main protagonists, George Siemens and Stephen Downs, who are seen collectively as the fathers of the MOOC movement. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Courses, and they are certainly making their presence felt in the tertiary or higher education sector particularly. But extending beyond the delivery of a MOOC, the theory of connectivism as a way of learning um, is gaining more credence in a wider variety of settings. And connectivism is based on two core tenets. It's a theory that knowledge consists of connections between entities in a network and that learning consists of developing and traversing the network. In other words, as George, George Siemens puts it, Learning is the network. So they challenge the idea that as individuals we make meaning and construct things inside our heads. Rather, they say that learning is what happens within the network, between people. Siemens and Downs argue that theories of behaviourism, cognitivism and constructivism and all the variations that go around those three core groups of theories um, fall short when talking about learning that moves into informal, networked and technology-enabled arenas. Let's examine George Seaman's uh, principles of connectivism and unpack them just a little bit more. The first principle is that learning and knowledge rests in a diversity of opinions, something that I hold dear to my heart and probably um, is reflected in the amount of opportunities I give my students to share their different opinions and knowledge and understandings. 
Secondly, learning is a process of connecting specialised nodes or information sources. Siemens would argue that a learner can exponentially improve their own learning by plugging into an existing network, as my daughter did in that example I gave you about her corset making. She plugged into a network, a very specialised network of people who held an enormous amount of knowledge, and her learning um, occurred through that connection. Learning may reside in non-human appliances. Learning, in the sense that something is known but not necessarily actuated, um, can rest within a community, within a network, or within a database. I think the next principle is a really important one, the next two particularly, and speak to me quite strongly. The capacity to know more is more critical than what is known. And I think this challenges... Um, how we do school to a significant extent. Knowing where to find information is more important than knowing information. Yet, particularly in the higher stakes end of our schooling, we place um, a, a high privilege on being able to show what you know rather than show how you can come to know. So I think that particular principle of connectivism poses a substantial challenge to how we teach. The importance of connections, of nurturing and maintaining those connections, is key in a connectivist approach. So to facilitate that continual learning, we need to maintain the connections that we have, the networks that we have. Connection making making those connections provides a far greater return on our effort than simply seeking to understand a single concept. Another principle that's close to my heart is the ability to see connections between fields, between ideas and between concepts. In secondary school, for almost forever, learning has been compartmentalised into different subject discipline areas. Increasingly, this is a trend that we will see emerge in primary schools as the federal government's recommendations uh, insist that all teachers graduating from primary teaching preparation programs have a specialisation of some form. Um, but that concerns me because it's this ability to see connections between ideas and concepts from one discipline to another is, is how the world actually works, the world beyond schooling and beyond university. So what are we doing in schools to encourage our students to make those connections between ideas, between different fields, across different fields, across different disciplines? Learning in a, in a connectivist sense um, is based around the desire for accurate and up-to-date knowledge. And again, this is where a network can play an incredibly important role. Finally, decision-making itself is a learning process. Developing skills in our students about choosing what to learn and about the meaning of information that they collect is a really important, uh, important skill. Siemens argues that there might be a right answer now, but because of shifting realities, shifting contexts, that answer might be wrong tomorrow. So deciding what's important, what new information means, is a critical skill. I talked in Introduction to Educational Settings about the de-schooling movement that's promulgated by people like Illich and others who talk about the potential of technology to remove the need for schools and teachers as formally constituted in our education system. That is, they're predicting the end of formal education. And Thomas and Celie Brown, to a certain extent, are part of this camp where they talk about informal learning in the network based on play. A little bit more about that in our next lecture as well. We're seeing this de-schooling uh, play out in higher education with the increased participation in MOOCs 
and with predictions of the end of bricks and mortar universities as we move more and more into online delivery of post-compulsory education. Will this trend, like so many, in, so many others in education, filter down to schools? Possibly. At secondary schools, particularly in upper levels, we can already see how readily young people can access information and how readily young people can connect to and create information. I wonder then, why is it that so many teachers insist on so much of their teaching as telling, as giving and transmitting information, when as Siemens and Downs point out in their connectivism theory, that information is readily accessible through networks. The principle that we just went through, that the capacity to know more is more critical than what is currently known. Knowing where to find information is more important than knowing information. Yet so much of what we do as teachers, particularly in secondary spheres, is to transmit information. I think this raises a really important implication for your own approach as teachers. I think what it raises is the opportunity for a lot more designing of learning opportunities that reflect how people learn more in the 21st century, that reflect potentially more personalised learning opportunities for students. So what might connectivism look like at school? I don't think what I'm talking about anyway is to develop MOOCs within a school Although potentially that opportunity exists to push more um, of the teaching and learning to online spaces as we do at universities. But perhaps it looks a little bit more like this. At the moment in learning in schools, what tends to happen is that the majority of students, nearly all students, work on the same topic, the same concept at the same time. In connectivist learning, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. We wouldn't be working to a fixed curriculum, but it would be a more personal curriculum. Now, whilst that might uh, throw up, it might cause people to throw their, their hands up in horror, um, perhaps we're not talking about a whole scale activity here. Perhaps we're talking about an opportunity in schools to model a connectivist learning approach that will better prepare our students for their learning beyond the classroom. Learning is a lifelong requirement. Information is not static. Knowledge changes. Our ability to keep pace with that is a crucial skill if we're preparing our students for a 21st century world. So perhaps we need to start thinking a little bit about 21st century pedagogies. Do we negotiate individual projects with our students? Do we at least at some part of our academic year provide opportunities for a more personalised learning? Do we model and assist our students to develop their personal learning networks that involve people, sources and organisations that are beyond the classroom that may or may not be in a digital form but where technology can facilitate those connections, that network nurturing and maintaining. I think these sorts of ideas open up uh, a number of opportunities for us to think about our teaching in relation to the SAMAR model, the topic of last week's lecture and that what the ideas around connectivism suggest is quite a significant redefinition for at least part of what we do in a school year uh, to be more consistent with the ideas that the connectivist theories put forward. Think a little about the sorts of applications that we're exploring and how the majority of them, particularly the Web 2 based applications, have a capacity for students to share their knowledge with a much wider audience. Connectivism is as much about constructing and contributing and creating knowledge as it is about tapping into networks to consume knowledge. So think a little bit about the sorts of applications that we're looking at in connected classrooms and how they might support you to design opportunities for your students to practice connectivism because it's certainly going to be 
a form of learning that they will engage in once they have left the formal education, formal schooling system.